Hi, I'm Dr. DeVazier, your organic chemistry instructor. This week you'll be performing the aldol reaction in solventless conditions in a test tube. Some of the techniques in this lab will be melting point determination, recrystallization, vacuum filtration, and percent yield. All four of these will be on your lab practicum at the end of the quarter, so it's real important that you get started on the right foot. Your four student goals are the following. It's your primary concern to work safely in the laboratory, which means that you need to look out not only for your own workplace, but for those around you. It's also critical that you dispose of waste properly while using the principles of green chemistry. You need to learn the new techniques that we just went over, um, and those are going to improve your laboratory skills, not only specific to organic chemistry, but also in uh, record keeping and um, um, some attention to detail that will improve your lab skills in other classes. And anytime we do any reaction chemistry, it's very important to achieve a high yield. Typically, that means it's greater than 50% of a pure product. And it's always critical that you need to think about the equipment that you're using, think about your science, think about the nature of what you're doing, and the experimental uh, processes so that you can improve the method, or at least address that in the future. The first major uh, issue in terms of chemical um, handling is sodium hydroxide. It is uh, corrosive. You'll notice that um, if you do get any on your hands, the first thing that you want to do is rinse very thoroughly with water. You'll notice a soapy feeling associated with the, um, the action of sodium hydroxide on the skin, um, which is essentially a saponification reaction of your uh, um, fatty uh, outer layer of your skin so it sort of feels like a soap because that's actually what's forming and um, you'll need to rinse until you can no longer feel that soapy feeling. However it is important um, that you avoid contact with your skin and use gloves whenever possible. Um, you'll also need to make sure that you work in the chemical hood to avoid inhalation and uh, direct exposure to vapors. Um, the solids that you're going to be working with are organic solids. They're not salts, um, so they do have a marginal vapor pressure. And also the dust associated with any of those materials um, could be potentially hazardous. So uh, work in the hood to avoid any of those uh, direct exposures. In terms of uh, working safely, you want to make sure that uh, you also dispose of waste properly and the um, containers um, uh, and the proper containers. And so anytime you have a question, just ask your instructor. That's the main thing. Um, however, um, you would first start by cleaning your glassware with some rinse ethanol. It should be located in your hood. Um, if, uh, if the container is empty, then just uh, ask your instructor. They'll help you out. Um, and then um, uh, you'll want to make sure that you uh, take your two major waste products. One is a filtrate. Um, which is a liquid left over after vacuum filtration, and dispose of that in the aqueous waste container. Um, in, uh, in that disposal, you want to make sure that there are no solid particles, no organic matter uh, in your filtrate. So if you do have any solid um, and you are not able to separate it out from the liquid mixture, from the solution mixture, then you want to make sure that you dispose of that in the flammable organic waste. Okay. So one more time, the filtrate without any solid formation goes in the aqueous waste container. If it has any of the solid, make sure you put that in the flammable organic container. Your solid product is an organic product, um, but it also has to be disposed of, and it should go in the solid waste container. Make sure that you only throw away the solid organic product and not any filter paper or gloves or paper towels. Those go in the waste basket. In order to learn the new techniques that are involved in this lab, you'll want to make sure that you watch the technique tutorials on recrystallization, um, which is basically a technique that involves um, adding minimal amount of um, a marginally soluble solvent to, to a material, generally a solid, um, and then that solid will, uh, upon cooling, will come out of solution and then can be filtered. Um, you'll also want to watch the um, technique tutorial on melting point. Um, which involves the melt temp apparatus. You'll look through an eye hole um, and then you'll watch your compound as it melts and record the temperature from the first point of melting uh, to the final uh, point of melting. That is until your sample is completely liquid. Uh, there is a magnifying glass um, at the keyhole, um, at the eye hole rather. Um, and here you want to make sure that you don't set your temperature higher than about halfway up 
um, you want to make sure that you have a slow steady temperature ramp. And then uh, the other technique is uh, vacuum filtration. Um, in terms of hands-on technique, we also need to talk about percent yield calculation, but that's a little bit different. Uh, so vacuum filtration involves the um, use of a vacuum aspirator, typically um, a faucet. And the aspirator um, uh, is the vacuum pressure, uh, um, absence of pressure applied to a sample so that when you pour your slurry, which is a mixture of solid um, and a liquid suspension, um, that the solid then is separated from that liquid suspension. Just make sure you use filter paper on your filter. You should be in pretty good shape. Make sure you read um, the background section on melting point and your, uh, and your lab uh, supplemental material. Also make sure you lead, read your lab protocol. Um, your lab protocol is in your lab notebook and must be there before you can begin lab. Make sure you take the online pre-lab quiz before you enter lab. Check ANGEL for availability dates or Moodle. The reaction is uh, the following. We'll react 3,4-dimethoxybenzaldehyde um, and 1-endenone uh, to form the aldol condensation product. Now in this case, sodium hydroxide is used as a catalyst. So with catalysts, um, it's a little bit different. It's not the more the merrier. You don't want a, um, a stoichiometric amount. Only a very small uh, mole percent of sodium hydroxide is added. So um, in terms of your uh, laboratory notebook entry, um, and this goes along with the uh, idea of, of techniques and skills in the laboratory, um, your laboratory notebook entry should have the um, least amount of writing with the greatest amount of impact. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't write everything, but the goal is to make sure that you write down absolutely um, the uh, most pertinent information uh, so that there's no uh, confusion with, with detail. So if you look here, this is the table I like to use um, where the uh, leftmost column is the uh, reference column and that has, um, as you'll note, molecular weight, theoretical amount, and actual amount. Theoretical amount is the amount prescribed in your lab protocol and the actual amount is what you weigh out in the laboratory. And then the um, each of the other column, sorry, that was the that was the leftmost column. Each of the other columns are then labeled by the various uh, reactants and products that you'll be using in the lab. So um, then you just draw out the molecular weight. Make sure you have that so that it will be easy to calculate percent yield from the actual amount of the limiting reagent. You should achieve a high yield and a pure product and in order to do that you want to make sure that you follow the reaction protocol exactly. Um, the goal here is um, to observe a few things. One is that when you mix the two reagents they might not immediately start to melt. And I'll show you a video here in just a second um, but eventually those will become go from a white um, or off-white um, color to a brown oil, a very viscous oil. Then you're going to add um, <clears throat> sodium hydroxide, allow that um, to mix and continue to mix um, and then let it sit for about 15 minutes and uh, to react and under those solid conditions and then at some point the liquid should turn to solid in that 15 minute period. Um, after that occurs then you're going to neutralize or after that 15 minute period is up you'll neutralize with 10 percent hydrochloric acid Make sure the pH actually going to go all the way past the neutralization to the point of acidity. So you check the pH um, and you'll want to filter the acidic solid. And then um, you'll purify by recrystallizing from hot 90% ethanol, 10% water. Okay, you make sure you just use a small amount and add that sparingly in order to just dissolve your product. You should get no more than 20 mils of that solvent in your, in your uh, recrystallization. And then you'll characterize your product based on melting temperature. You want to make sure that you get um, a dry weight and um, uh, of your crude product that is before recrystallization and then after your recrystallization. So make sure you get a dry weight of both of those different materials, the crude and the pure products. And you're going to want to make sure that you allow it to dry and before you take your melting temperature. Otherwise, you'll run into one of two problems. One, your melting temperature will be artificially lowered and your product may seem a lot more impure than um, what you would think it should be based on your recrystallization uh, because it's contaminated with water. 
The other issue, and this is a much more practical issue, but a much more frustrating issue, is that if you have a wet sample, it gets stuck in the capillary, so you're not able to take a very good, or at all, um, melting point. So that's something to think about and look out for. Talk to your instructor about um, the flexibility on deadlines in terms of your lab report. It might need to wait a week to dry out. In general, there's always going to be four major um, steps in a reaction. That is the reaction, the workup, the purification, and then the characterization. We will modify one um, place in the procedure uh, for this week's reaction, and that is um, the uh, grinding of sodium hydroxide. We actually um, will not use a mortar and pestle. We'll be using sodium hydroxide flakes, so we will not need to grind that sodium hydroxide. You might need to break it up a little bit, but don't grind it. We found that that was um, prohibitive to a good yield. It was tough because sodium hydroxide is so hygroscopic. Um, it was absorbing water, and as you grind it into the mortar and pestle, we were unable to get any sort of accurate measurements um, and weren't getting a good yield. So don't grind the sodium hydroxide. Just use the flakes. Now, here is a, an example of the... Uh, of the reaction. So it's done in a test tube. Um, notice that um, here this this is uh, me adding the reagents to the test tube and notice I've clamped it. Um, the most important thing here is that you don't ever put the test tube in the palm of your hand and then stir it using another glass rod. That could just cause the bottom of that test tube is pretty weak. See there's the white powder so that's what it looks like after you first mix them. And then you continue to mix, and watch you'll see in a second, it's, it's the brown liquid. Um, yeah, there's the brown liquid, so that's what you should observe after a few minutes, uh, maybe a couple minutes of mixing. And then once you stir it until you, uh, um, and wait it about 15 minutes, then you neutralize. Um, and then you want to make sure that once you've added your um, hydrochloric acid, the 10% hydrochloric acid, that you mix that up a little bit um, to make sure that you've actually uh, pronated all of your uh, product so that you can recover it. Um, so again here you want to make sure that um, you follow the protocol uh, with the exception of grinding the sodium hydroxide. Mix all of your reagents. Wait for that brown oil. Once you get that brown oil then you add the sodium hydroxide Mix it for a little while longer and then just let it sit for 15 minutes and then neutralize. Um, when you neutralize, you want to make sure you shake up. Um, don't cover it. Don't cover the test tube with your thumb and shake. Do exactly as you saw in the video there where you're holding the test tube with your non-dominant hand and you flick it with your, um, uh, with your other hand. Okay, so that's very important. You're going to isolate the solid by vacuum filtration. All of those um, have, uh, that's a video tutorial. Also, the recrystallization has a video tutorial, so there's a lot more information there. Um, and then uh, once you uh, um, are to the stage where you are doing your recrystallization, the solution of ethanol should already be prepared, so you shouldn't have to um, prepare that on your own. In terms of thinking about the logical sequence of steps in your experiment and it, that's one issue, and sometimes that's tough when you don't really understand the mechanism of the reaction fully well. But the other thing that's really important that will translate to every single class and lab that you have is to simply think logically about and practically about what it is you're doing. Um, it, why would we say to use a glass test tube um, rather than a beaker, for example, in this, this experiment? Um, and so ask some of those questions that might sort of seem so obvious, they're, um, they're not clear. So it, it's really important that, that you start to think about some of those things and ask those questions. Ask your instructor. Um, it's, it's really critical. And then you never want to get thrown off by a complex equation, uh, like the one that we have here. These are a very complex chemical formula. And, um, but the main thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you can still determine um, the, uh, the actual formula from the structures. And if you'll notice, what you're, what's happening here is we're losing a water molecule. So this reaction uh, would be balanced if we added one mole of water, one mole of water to the right-hand side, to the product side. 
So it's very important that you always ask those questions as well. What, what's going on from the basic molecular formula standpoint? Is this an addition reaction? What's happening? Those are your critical questions. Um, the post lab is uh, uh, pretty straightforward. You'll make sure you have the grading rubric as your title page um, and all the information uh, key to that is, is posted uh, in the post lab right up. And you'll also want to make sure that you get signatures from both partners. They have to be there to um, basically indicate that there is an equal distribution of work for the, pro, uh, for the post lab. And um, you also want to make sure that you have an experimental procedure uh, for your uh, for your general uh, protocol that um, you can um, then reproduce. The goal here is to write in the manner consistent with scientific publication. If you can translate your procedure into that language, then ideally, uh, very soon, you'll be able to take that language and translate that into a more specific procedure. The results section must include mass yield, uh, percent yield, and um, all characterization data, including melting points. And then your appendix must include both copies of the lab partner's notebook entries to receive full credit. Okay. I'd like to thank um, the folks at the University of Oregon for putting together the Green Organic Chemistry Manual, Dr. Brandt, Dr. Weatherman, and Dr. Allison for all of their help in the supplemental materials um, uh, in those preparations. Um, I would like to thank uh, the Aldrich Chemical Company and the Journal of Organic Chemistry for uh, supplying some materials for this video. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Hope you guys have a great weekend.